are in a spirit of revival and I appreciate the patience of this church, your prayer. Yesterday was a great day and inviting people and all you're doing, your giving, all of that. I thank you for it. Uh, there are seasons in the life of a church. There are seasons. This revival was unplanned and and all of that. And Brother Adams will be back in the pulpit before long. And uh, but we need to we need to get all we can while the season is here. The bets will be moving on uh, before long, and and we need to get all we can from this moment. Mark six verse one. And he went out from thence and came into his own country. And his disciples follow him. When the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him? that even such mighty works are wrought by His hands. For sake of time, just jump down to verse 5. And He could there do no mighty work. You know who this was speaking about? Jesus Christ. He could there do no mighty work. Save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. Now the Bible said He could there do no mighty work. He desired. He wanted. He had plans to do a mighty work. Maybe heal everybody. Maybe empty, I paraphrase now, but maybe he desired to empty their hospitals. Maybe he desired to raise the whole graveyard. Maybe. The Bible said he could there do no mighty work. Save. He laid his hands upon a few sick folk. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages. I want to preach to you for a little while this morning, and um, I won't be long, very long, but I want to preach to you about left alone, with just a reminder. Left alone, with just a reminder he could there do no mighty work save he laid his hand on a few he left them alone but he also left them with a reminder of what could have been Lord We have been all busy this week. We've been running to and fro. We've been working. We've been planning. We've been doing a lot. And now, God, not because I'm preaching, not at all, but we have come to the most important moment of our week and for somebody, our life. Please give me an anointing. Give me a liberty. Give this congregation an anointing of your spirit. 
talk to us, God. Don't let us resist the flow of this direction of the Spirit. Let us flow with you, God. I beg you, as I have begged all week, I beg you to save somebody. I love you and I need you so bad. Amen. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. And for three and a half years, all he did, all he did is heal the sick, feed the multitude, forgive people that were in his presence, that were sinners. He served as a physical and spiritual physician to those that needed him desperately. After he was baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan, not for his sin, but to fulfill all the law, he had to be 30, and he had to be cleansed to start his public ministry And after he did, Simon Peter, who walked with him uh, just about all of that time, he said in the book of Acts, looking back on the ministry of Jesus Christ, and if you will, a very short commentary, a sentence worth of commentary, said about Jesus Christ, all he did was went about doing good. That's all he did. Never hurt anybody, never injured anybody, never... Oh, I know he rebuked religious people. I know that that he was strong in the temple, but when it came to the hurting, he never hurt anybody. When it came to the hungry, he never hurt anybody. When it, when it came to those who needed him desperately and knew they needed him, he never injured anybody. I will give you very, 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 I have a book that details all the miracles of Jesus Christ and it's not our intent today, but I just want to show you His intent on this earth. What God really, we know, I don't have time to even even tell you that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. God was in flesh. I don't have time to go through all of that. But you know that. But but he was so much more than just a normal, ordinary Hebrew. He he was God in flesh. But just, just allow me to go through a few things. That Jesus did while on earth. In Matthew 20, he healed two blind men as he was passing by. In Matthew chapter 8, he laid his hand upon the fevered brow of Simon Peter's mother in law. That fever left her body. In Matthew chapter 14, he fed 5,000 men beside women and children with just five loaves and two fish. And then they took basketfuls home with them. In Luke 7, He raised a man from death in Luke 17. He healed ten lepers and with his word. In fact, one of them, he made them whole when he turned around to offer thanksgiving to the Lord. In John 10, he turned water. Jesus, I'm talking about. He turned water into wine. In John chapter 11, he raised Lazarus from the dead, which had been in the grave for four days and on and on and on and on we could go. The rest of the afternoon I could recite to you miracles that Jesus had performed everywhere he went. Everywhere he went. Jesus desired to mend the broken heart. Everywhere he went. Jesus desired to feed the hungry soul and the empty belly. Everywhere Jesus went, he desired to bless, to heal, 
to save, to strengthen. I hope you're listening to me. Everywhere he went, he never desired to hurt anybody. He never desired to injure anybody. He never desired to mess up anything. Everywhere he went, what religion messed up, he fixed up. What sin destroyed, he put back together. That is the Lord Jesus Christ that I preach about this morning. (laughs) But there is a divine law. We don't hear a whole lot about it in our modern era. Sorry to say, sad to say, even... In our Pentecostal ranks, we do not hear a lot about it, but there is a divine law of God that God will not go anywhere He is not welcome. God will not go anywhere that He is not desired. God is a perfect gentleman. Let me put you at ease this morning and tell you that if you are a guest here, a visitor here today, we are so happy and honored that you have come to be with us. But let me tell you, I talk to people and they say, I'm scared to go to the Pentecostal church. I'm afraid to go to the Pentecostal church because I'm afraid something's going to jump on me. Something's going to get on me or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk in some funny language or I'm going to act some funny way. No, it will not happen, friend, unless you desire God. God is not a beggar that is sitting by the highway begging for people to accept him. But God is a God that comes to us. Listen to me. He comes to us and he lets us know I have plans for you. I have desires for you. I have good things for you. I have mercy for your sin. I have grace for your problem. I have answers for your questions. I have salvation for your sin. But if you do not want me and you do not desire me, then I will move to somebody else. Now that is a truth of the gospel that we do not hear a lot about. Jesus even told his disciples, if you go into a city and they reject you, he said, shake the dust off of your feet and move on to somebody else. I want to rise today and preach to you that God can leave us alone. God can leave us alone if we keep God at arm's length and and we sit through service after service and, and, and sermon after sermon and we feel the tug of God and and we feel the pull of the Holy Ghost and we say no to God too many times and we tell God no one time too many. It is entirely possible that the good work that God came to do, he will leave us alone and he will do it for somebody else. I have just spent 10 minutes telling you about the desires of Jesus and telling you about the good things that Jesus desires to do. I I believe that it is altogether provable today that when Jesus went home, when he went to Nazareth, he desired to do for them what he had done for everybody else. The Bible said that he went there and, and as soon as he went into town, they said, is not this the carpenter's son? He went to church, he went to the synagogue and he began to teach. And you can read it in Matthew 13 and read it in Mark chapter 4 where Jesus began to teach. He even healed a man in church with a withered hand. He even gave them a demonstration of what could happen in their lives. But they said, we don't want you, God. We we don't have time for you, God. They were offended at his word and they were offended at his word. Oh, oh, help us in this generation not to be so thin-skinned that we are offended at the Word of God and the work of God. 
I was listening to the radio the other night, XM radio, and and they were talking political stuff and they had a, a group of people, much like I'm preaching to right now, and, and person after person after person, Brother Adams, said that offended me. When they talk about God, that offended me. When they, when they want to mention Jesus, that offends me. When they, when they want to talk about this or that, and I turned to my wife, I was shocked, I was amazed. And person after person said, I'm offended. I, I'm offended at that. I told her, I said, America is so thin-skinned and easily offended. Listen to me. When Jesus shows up in my presence, I do not want his work or his word to offend me. When Jesus says, I'm here to save you and pull you out of your sin and change you. I do not want to be offended by his work or his word. They were offended. They, they, they could not believe he was who he said he was. And, and they desired that he would leave their country. Listen, somebody. Every time you come to church, I know, I know there would be nobody here this morning. I say I know, I don't think there would be anybody here in this house today that would say, I don't want you, God. I don't believe there would be anybody here today that would say, no, God, I, I want to go to hell and I want to enjoy the trip and I don't want God in my life I don't want God to mess up my life. No, I don't think you're here today or or you would not have even come to church. But I am preaching to people today that say, God, I don't have time for you this morning. I, I, I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to come to an altar. I've got too many plans, God. And and I'm just not ready to change, God. I, I enjoy the things that I do. I enjoy the things that I watch. I enjoy the life that I live. I'm just not ready to walk to an altar and give my heart to God. Oh, friend, listen. When God calls you, you cannot tell him no. When God calls you, you cannot tell him that you'll come to him when you desire to. But when God calls, you got to heed the call of God when God reaches you got to reach back for God hallelujah help me church I know we're not shouting but help me I don't want you to clap your hands I want you to feel what I'm preaching right now I'm reaching for somebody's soul it's a serious thing to say no to God it's a serious thing to say I don't want to live for God I don't have time for God I I don't have time for the things of God I don't have time for an altar I don't have time for Jesus to come into my life and mess it all up I don't have time for God to do some things in my life maybe when I get older maybe when I get some things done maybe sometime in the future maybe sometime somewhere else maybe maybe God but I'm telling you Jesus went to Nazareth and he said I've got the same power here that I've got everywhere else I've got the same words of salvation here that I've got everywhere else I've got the same healing touch here that I've got everywhere else and they said we don't want you here God we don't have time for you we don't believe you are who you say you are and we are offended at what you're saying we are offended at what you want to do friend listen to me all God wants to do is save your soul all God wants to do is forgive your sin all God wants wants to do is change your life please please don't make God leave you alone I'm telling us it's a real deal God left him brother Adams God walked away. God left him. Jesus turned his back on him and said, all right, if you don't want me, I'm going to go somewhere that does. Is it possible? Is it possible that God visits the foreign field because those people there want him? Is it possible that America religiously is 
dying because America don't need God. We don't need God. We got our smartphone. We got our computer. We got our credit card. We don't need God. We got our high rise hospitals. I'm rising to tell you today. I don't care what you possess. I don't care what you own. You need God more than you need anything in the world. You need his love. You need his mercy. You need his salvation. Don't leave me, God. I need you. I preach to people right now that may be your own God, but you'll never be your own Savior. I preach to people right now that may be wrapped up in your world, your job, your business, your future, your family, your money, your desires. Hear me today, friend. When God comes to visit you, you cannot tell him some other day. You cannot tell him some other time. You cannot tell him I'll walk to an altar when I get ready. I'll walk to a baptistry when I get ready. I'll get the Holy Ghost when I get ready. You cannot do that. But God has shown up today. And God said I've got some power for you. I got some love for you. I got some grace for you. I got some mercy for you. But, but they just, they just, they, they, they don't want him. They, 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 they were offended by him and they rejected him. And, and it is entirely possible. It is entirely possible that God leave you alone. It is entirely possible that God walk away from you. You say, I don't believe it, preacher. He did here. He walked away from them. He could there do no mighty work. Oh, he desired to heal. Oh, he desired to save. He desired to bless. He desired to do for them what he had done for everybody else. But they kept him that arm's arm length. They they did not receive him. They did not want him. They did not desire him. Am I preaching to somebody today that says I want to come to church every once in a while and just feel Jesus but I don't want Jesus to change me. I don't want God to make any demands on me. I don't want God to dig me up. I don't want to pray. I don't want to repent of my sins. Am I preaching to somebody right now that's a backslider that says I enjoy the life that I live too much I enjoy the things that I do too much and I preach it to a hypocrite young person right now that refuses the call of commitment and I preach it to somebody right now that God says I want to take you to a new place in this revival I want to do something new for you in this revival and you say not today God not this revival God not now God not now now, not now, not now. All right, all right, all right, I'll leave you alone. You want me to leave you alone, I'll leave you alone. But as Jesus was headed out of town, I read it to you. As he was walking out of town, he's laid his hand on a few sick folk. He healed a few sick folk. Why, why, why did he do that? He left them a reminder of what could have been for them. He left them a reminder every time they went from the church to the house and they visited their sick bed and they visited some family member that was sick. It was a reminder to them if I would have let Jesus in my house, if I would have let Jesus do what he wanted to do in this city, everybody could have been healed. I'm preaching to you that everybody in this house can have salvation. Everybody here can have peace. Everybody here can have the joy of God but you gotta let God you gotta let God I can't make you pray I can't make you repent I can't make you get the Holy Ghost I can't talk you into an altar you gotta say yes God I feel like preaching to somebody you gotta say no to sin you gotta say no to flesh you gotta say no to self and you gotta say yes I don't want 
want God to leave me alone. I don't want to come to church and not feel God. I don't want to come to church and not feel conviction. I don't want to sit in under a sermon and not feel the hand of God. Leave them alone. Leave them alone. I'm going to leave you with the reminder. I'm going to heal somebody in your family. I'm going to heal somebody in your neighborhood. Can I paraphrase and tell you? You may say no to God, sir, but he's going to leave you with the reminder. He may save your son. Hallelujah. One Sunday night, your daughter or your son is going to come home and say, Daddy, I got the Holy Ghost tonight. It's a reminder. Your wife may call you or your husband may call you one day and say I got baptized today dad I got baptized today mom it's a reminder God will leave you alone if you don't want him God will walk away from you if you don't want him but he will leave you with the reminder he will leave you with the reminder in the previous chapter that I read from, I read from Mark chapter 6. In Mark chapter 5, we read the story of the demoniac. We've heard it preached oh so many times. That man lived among the tombs. Listen to me. He lived among the tombs and, and he was there crying and cutting himself with stones and, and howling in the night. And the Bible said that Jesus when cast out these 2,000 devils out of that man. And the Bible said, I, I think it's amazing, Brother Hunter, the Bible said that this man, after he was clothed and in his right mind, he said, can I follow you, Jesus? I'd like to follow you everywhere you go. Anybody that could do for me what you've done for me, I want to follow you. And the whole city came out and they saw what had happened. And they were, they were astounded and they were amazed. And then they said something that were absolutely unbelievable to me. They said, Jesus, we don't want you in our city. Leave our coast. We don't want you here, God. We want you to leave us alone. We got us a good deal going. We enjoy the cigarettes we smoke. We enjoy the beer we drink. We enjoy the parties we have. We enjoy the pornography we watch. We enjoy the bed of immorality. We don't want you messing it up. We don't want the Holy Ghost messing it up. We don't want an altar messing it up. Leave this place, Jesus. And your Bible, your Bible said, Jesus left them alone. He walked away. And this man, this man, this man said, Lord, can I follow you? You did for me what nobody could do for me. You put my life back together. You changed my life. Can I follow you? Oh, I want to follow you everywhere you go. Your Bible said, Jesus said, go home. Go home. Go back home. I want you to be a reminder. Read it in your Bible. He said, you go home and you tell what good things God has done for you. You go home and you be a reminder I could have cast out all their devils. I could have saved all of their sickness. I could have healed all of their diseases. You go home and you be a reminder to them of what could have happened. Oh. I do not want God to leave me with a reminder. I don't want one of my children to tell me how good church is Sunday night. I don't want them to tell me how God blessed them. I don't want a reminder of what God could have done for me. But I want to be in the midst of what God's doing. I want to be a part of what God's doing. I want God to do it for me. Just a reminder. Just a reminder. 
If you don't want God, he'll leave you. If you don't want God, he won't force you. Nobody's going to force you to pray today. Nobody's going to force you to join this church today. Nobody's going to force you to be baptized in heaven's sweetest name today. Nobody's going to force you to receive the Holy Ghost today. If you don't want God, he will leave. He will leave you alone. Oh, you say, preacher, I ain't heard preaching like this. I don't believe that. The Bible said in Proverbs chapter 1, I reached for you. I I called for you and you were none of my reproof and, and you would not receive me. God, God, God said, therefore when your fear cometh, I will laugh at you. I will mock when your fear cometh. I'm telling you it's a serious thing to ignore the outstretched hand of God. It's a serious thing to turn a deaf ear to the almighty voice of God. It's a serious thing to play with your salvation and play with the things of God. It's a serious thing. Serious. Serious. All right, all right, God. All right, come on, Sister Betts. All right, God. All right, all right, all right. We feel you. We hear you in the temple. We know what you want to do. We know what you want to do, but we don't want you. We don't want you here. We don't want you doing thing for us. We don't want you to heal our sick. We don't want you to raise our dead. We don't want you to save our loss. All right. All right. This is in the Bible, folks. It's in the Bible. All right. If you don't want me, I'll leave you alone. If you're tired of feeling conviction, he'll leave you alone. Young people, if you're tired of being preached to about right and wrong, God will leave you alone. If you're tired of the preacher pointing to you and preaching to you about secret things that God reveals to him while he's preaching, God will leave you alone. That's what you want. God will leave you alone. But he'll leave you with a reminder. Your little sister, your little brother, your cousin will come home and say, Hey, have you ever had the Holy Ghost? I got the Holy Ghost in Sunday school. What is that? That's a reminder of what could have been for you. When your little boy, your little girl comes and sits on your lap, Dad. Hey, Dad, I got something better than a Sunday school lesson today. I got something better than a piece of candy. I got the Holy Ghost in Sunday school, Dad. And you sat here in a service like this. No, God. Not today, God. Not now, God. Too busy. What about my business? I'm not going to go to that church and work hard all week and give that preacher my money. All right, God heard you. All right, he'll leave you alone. But he'll leave you with a reminder. As he was walking out of the city, he laid his hand on just a few sick. Just touched a few. What are you doing, Jesus? I want them to be a reminder to this city. I want them to be a witness to this community. What could have been. Let me preach to somebody in this church right now. Let me preach to somebody in this church right now that says... I don't know why we got to keep on in revival. I don't know why why the beds have to stay here. I don't know why we got to keep talking about building and a revival. All right, all right. If you don't want God, he'll walk out. He'll leave you alone. And you can have your little small, dark, 
world. Without God, without His love, without His power, without His demonstration, He'll leave you alone. But He'll leave you with a reminder. That man was too busy for God. That man was too preoccupied for God. He had too much going to fool with God. Think about eternity. Think about living forever somewhere. I don't have time to think about God, preacher. I don't have time to fool with the things of God. All right. But one day, everybody hear me. Hear me. One day, that man was carried across the threshold of eternity. Job didn't matter, business didn't matter, stocks and bonds didn't matter, fishing boat didn't matter, neighbors didn't matter, nobody mattered now. Listen to me, listen to me. He's crossed over into eternity. And he said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water. Sin who? Sin who? Sin that fellow that I remember. The only thing I remember is a man laid at my gate full of sores. I don't remember the number of my account. I don't remember the balance of my checkbook. All I remember is somebody that could have connected me to God. All I remember is that boy named Lazarus. I'm telling somebody right now, you're going to hear my voice more than just today. You're going to hear the voice of Brother Adams more than just when you physically sit in a church pew. You're going to hear the voice of the preacher. Please come. Please pray. Please say yes to God. Please give your life to God. You're going to hear our voice in your future. Imagine, everybody would just give me one more moment, I'm through. Imagine, imagine, you try to talk to God, you try to speak to God, God, you desire to hear from God, imagine, just silence. No more love. No more reaching. No more demonstration. No more mercy. No more grace. No more preaching. No more altar call. Just silence. Just two or three years ago, my family and I were traveling west. We visited Vancouver, British Columbia. I heard a story that reminds me of a lot of people that I preach to every week. Off of Vancouver Island, There is a stretch of water known and called, identified as the zone of silence. This area is acoustically dead. 
It cannot give out any sound, nor can it receive any sound or signal. They warn ships when they go in this area for a stretch of the Pacific Ocean. You will be all by yourself. We could not contact you if we needed to. You could not contact us if you needed to. There's nothing but silence. They cannot explain it. They've not figured it out. But what I thought was as interesting as that was this. At the ocean floor, Under this zone of silence, there are many, many, many shipwrecks, much treasure, and many, many, many lost lives, all because they were in a zone. Silence. Do you know how horrible it is to travel without God? Do you realize how serious it is to go to work, to ride down the road, to live in a city like Memphis without God? All right, God said. Nazareth, if you're offended at me, I'll leave you alone. But I'm going to leave you with a few reminders. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one leave the building. Please, no one get up and leave the building, please. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around but the pastor. Oh God, God has never put a message on my heart. God put this on my heart for somebody. God has been reaching for you for weeks and weeks and months and months. You've come to church and felt God. You've sat here and thought about coming to pray, but you've made all kinds of excuses. Why not? God has reached for some of you Sunday night. God had a special call to some of you precious young people. I want to call you to a deep place of commitment. But this week, you've gone right back. You know what I fear? I see it. I see it right now in somebody's face. You're in a zone of silence. This message doesn't mean anything to you. You're wondering how long we're going to be at the altar so you can leave. You're in a, I see it right now. You're in a zone of silence. Nothing touches you. Nothing moves you. You don't feel anything. Sir, young lady, I would be scared to death. I would not trade places with someone like that for Donald Trump's billions of dollars. No, sir. I would not want to sit in a service like this and not be able to feel, understand God's reaching for me. As you sit here, As we're preparing to open this altar, who in this building, who in this building would say, pray for me, Brother Beds, pray for me, Brother Adams. Don't say a word out loud, just lift your hand. Pray for me, God bless you, God bless you. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. What about it, sir? You never had the Holy Ghost. What about it, ma'am? You've never repented of your sin. Would you just lift your hand? Pray for me, preacher. Pray for me. 
I need God. I need God. I need God. Now here's the way we're going to do it today. It's 12. We need to, we need to come and pray. I want everybody in the building to stand. And when you stand, my wife is going to begin to sing. I don't want you to wait. I don't want you to tarry. If you're here today and you don't want God to leave you alone, would you come join us at the altar? Please. Please. Quickly. If you don't want God to leave you alone, would you join us at the altar and find the place? Come close. With God and his Come close, angels ladies. Take another step to the altar, please. Thank are you. Are the demons thank you, thank you, thank in you. hell? You've got to live forever somewhere. Pray. Come on, brothers. Come on, brothers. Close your eyes and pray, please. Please. That's it. Come on. Come on. Come on. With God and His angels are the demons in hell. You. Saints of God, cry out, cry out. Church, lift your hands, let's pray. Everybody in the altar, would you lift up your hands? Let's pray right now.
over and pray for somebody. Please don't be unconcerned, church. Please don't be unconcerned, please. Brethren, would you reach over and pray for somebody? Come on, brethren. I don't want to be unconcerned. Oh, God, I don't want to live in a zone of silence. Come on, sisters, we're going to go home in less than five minutes. Please pray with somebody. Come on, come on, come on, that's it. God, don't let me be unconcerned. God, don't let me live without you. I don't want to learn to be a Pentecostal without God. Please, God. Please let me feel something right now. Come on, let's pray, brothers. Come on. God, let me feel something when I pray, please. Love and joy and heaven too. Only Jesus.
Well, we have heard a clear and a certain sound from God's word today. And once again, reminded how important it is that we uh, have our hearts right and be dedicated to the Lord. You know, it's a, uh, it, the, the kind of preaching we uh, heard today is not, it's, it's not a fun subject because it's very, very serious. And, and it, it's so true that this is about eternity. It's about being forever somewhere, either heaven or hell. And the decisions we make with what God does in reaching for us makes a difference in our eternity. And you see a pattern in the Bible through the Old Testament. God will reach for people and he'll show mercy and he'll call on their heart. And the different ways through overtures of love, God reaches and reaches and draws. But there comes a point and where that point is, none of us can exactly say. We can't say exactly where it is theologically. But there comes a point in which we resist and resist and push God away and push God away and push Him away. That very quietly, without any fanfare, His Spirit just stops dealing with us. We no longer feel that urge to pray no longer feel compelled to worship, no longer feel a need to be in church. And there's just nothing there. And what God will do is he'll begin to reach for other people. Israel rejected the Savior, and so he turned to the Gentiles. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans that we, the Gentiles, need to fear because just like He's able to do the same thing. So I'll tell you what, let's just let God know I'm going to seek you. I'm not going to push you away in any area of my life. And if we'll do that, then we'll be so blessed and uh, we can live for God and have victory. And I know there's people here that just recent weeks you've been getting in the church and you've been getting your life, uh, seeking the Lord and getting right with God. And I don't care what you're fighting with today. You can overcome. There is no battle. There is no problem that you're dealing with that other people haven't had to deal with in different shapes and ways and forms. And God's going to help you get through it. You're going to come up through it. You're going to come out of it. You're going to be victorious. Amen. And don't let the devil tell you no difference. There's no such thing as someone that's got to stay beat down when God's hands on their life. You might be beat down right now, but if you live for God, he's going to pick you up. 